thank Joe Fernandez today um, for joining us again. He's um, the head of product management for OpenShift, and we've done a number of talks on OpenShift um, V3, but this time we're going to try and do it from a rather than a deep dive on what's under the hood and the components there is to really focus on what the features are of V3, because uh, I think that's an, the other side of the, um, the reason why you're all using it. So um, with that, I'm going to let Joe Fernandez introduce himself and take it away. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks, Diane. So my name is Joe Fernandez. As Diane mentioned, I run product management for OpenShift. And, um, you know, as, as many of you know, we've been working over the past uh, year plus um, on OpenShift 3, which is the next major evolution of the OpenShift platform. Um, and, you know, uh, more of the, the, the core architecture and some of the things we're doing around um, uh, around specific areas like networking and, and uh, storage most recently and uh, talking a lot about what we're doing with Docker and Kubernetes. I just wanted to give more of an end-to-end -end view here, um, starting with, you know, why we, we, we decided to build what we're building and then also um, go through sort of an end-to-end -end perspective. Um, and then we're going to continue doing these um, types of briefings, um, you know, through the Commons initiative over the next uh, uh, several months so you can get uh, deeper into different aspects of OpenShift. So you've probably seen this slide before, but OpenShift 3 is, is really a brand new stack from top to bottom, right? So we're, we re rebuilt our containers API around Docker. Um, and, you know, containers have always been the core of OpenShift. And now with sort of the emergence of Docker as really a, a standard uh, for, for containers in the industry, we really felt like that was the right choice to, to build our new platform around. Uh, we've also rebuilt our orchestration engine um, around the, the Google Kubernetes project, built it on top of a new container optimized OS based on RHEL 7. Um, and really, as a result of these decisions, been able to expand uh, the choice of frameworks and services that we can provide, uh, you know, tapping into a much larger community uh, of available services, adding certification on top of that, and then built a whole number of, uh, of you know, developer and operator capabilities on top of that, which I'll also I get into today. You know, I think that you know the one of the biggest drivers was um, the emergence of, of all these uh, new standards, right? Uh, again, we we're bullish on Linux containers. We have been from the start. Uh, we feel that that's you know really um, uh, the best way to deploy applications and manage them at scale. Um, but now, um, you know, but in the past, each PaaS vendor has had their own bespoke implementation, right? So we had gears and cartridges and OpenShift. Heroku had Dynos, Google had their own implementation. They all use similar primitives like uh, Linux control groups, like kernel namespaces, but you know, differed in implementation. Um, with Docker now, you know, we have a, a standard packaging format for how we package content uh, to run in containers and working on a common API for how we um, instantiate those containers. And so that allows us to bring um, this capability into OpenShift, but to work it upstream with companies like Docker Inc., like Google, IBM, and others. And really, you know, I think it's that standard that's going to continue to drive um, container usage uh, across the industry. Um, we chose uh, Kubernetes as our orchestration and container management engine, and there we collaborate with with Google. Um, and there's, you know, more communities, you know, tons of communities emerging around uh, these standards. Uh, so our own project, Atomic, is one, and um, it seems like every every week, you know, something new pops up, uh, and so it's really an, an exciting time uh, in the container space specifically, and to see what's happening in open source in general. Um, we also get asked a lot about different trends uh, in enterprise software, right? When we're out talking to customers, um, you know, customers are, are interested in how they can evolve their development practices to more of a DevOps type model, and you know how different solutions can help with that. Uh, folks are considering uh, new application architectures and moving more towards microservices-based uh, deployment models. And, you know, we, we get asked about that in terms of how our platform can support that. And then, you know, an emergence of containers as a deployment model and something that enables deployment across a hybrid cloud architecture given the portability. So we get asked about that as well. Um, so, so with that, um, you know, sorry. Apologize for that. <laughs> um, so with that, uh, we've also learned a number of lessons over the last five years. Um, so we've, you know, uh, learned lessons about, uh, you know, 
what developers demand in terms of uh, you know, what they expect from our service, what they need for their applications, um, how they want to integrate OpenShift into their existing dev tools and processes. Um, and also on the infrastructure side, you know, when we deploy on premise, how do we integrate into a customer's compute infrastructure, into their networking infrastructure, uh, integrate with um, their existing application services, and how do we enable operations folks to manage uh, manage those uh, uh, the PaaS platform, manage containers at scale. So, so you know, you know there's been um, you know bumps in the road along the way, but certainly um, I think you know all of this experience has led to some of the um, decisions we've made here. And so let's go through it now and talk about um, you know the stack. So uh, so starting at the at the bottom, right? We I think you guys all know uh, OpenShift really is based around um, the latest uh, in uh, enterprise Linux, which is uh, RHEL 7, uh, which was released last June. So RHEL 7 is where Red Hat first introduced um, uh, full support for Docker uh, as a container uh, standard, as a container format. Um, and last week we just came out with RHEL 7.1. Um, and you know, we really we're trying to bring the enterprise grade security, stability, and reliability of RHEL uh, to the container space uh, and uh, and to Docker. Um, last week we announced uh, a new, uh, well we announced in addition to RHEL 7.1, a new variant called RHEL Atomic Host. And this is a, a new model for Linux, uh, a minimal footprint uh, container optimized OS. Um, so I know we had a big uh, session on that uh, today. Uh, so some of you guys may have, may have sat in on that, but you know, our goal for OpenShift is to allow operators to choose, right? To be able to run their OpenShift deployment either on a full uh, traditional RHEL implementation in RHEL 7, um, or uh, start to leverage RHEL Atomic Host as a minimal, uh, you know, uh, atomically updated uh, host OS uh, to uh, to to run, you know, more of an optimized footprint. Um, and you know, we've talked a lot about Docker. Uh, as well, but this is really again the core of OpenShift. This is the deployment model, and you know, really, there's there's two things uh, that we get from it, right? One is um, the API, the, the the engine for setting up the container uh, sandbox, for setting up the C groups, the namespaces, um, you know, SE Linux, and so forth, and then the the packaging format. And really, this this is what drew us to Docker the most. It's it's the 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 packaging format and the ecosystem that's built around that, where you know, these days you can go and get you know, uh, you know, almost any stack uh, from uh, from Docker Hub. So a vast community ecosystem upon which then we can you know we can certify you know enterprise ready uh, images and also work with customers on uh, on you know building out stacks that they need for their applications. This all this does move uh, uh, OpenShift fully into an immutable model uh, or image based deployment model. And that certainly has implications, which we'll talk about later, which drives some of the features. Um, but um, but we think that that's you know that's the right model for uh, for managing applications. It, it it certainly accelerates deployments, but also makes things like uh, rollbacks and so forth uh, much easier than than uh, our prior model, which was more build based. And then you know the other component we've talked about uh, quite a bit is is Kubernetes. Uh, but just to go a little deeper, you know, really th three things are important here with Kubernetes from our perspective. And for those who are familiar with OpenShift, this this largely takes over the functions of uh, what you know as the OpenShift broker. So Kubernetes is like the the broker tier in V3. Um, so the first thing it does is it helps us orchestrate uh, multi-container services. And I've talked about this in numerous presentations, but you know. Most applications on OpenShift or in general aren't going to run in a single container. So something needs to to wire those containers together uh, and uh, and create these uh, multi-container services and then wire those services to other services. So you may have a service that's your web tier or your web front end running something like Tomcat in a cluster of you know four or five containers, whatever the size of that cluster may be. And then perhaps that talks to another tier, another service tier, which is uh, say MySQL, uh, which you know, which you may run in a clustered setup as well, um, and it may talk to get another service, which is maybe a an a, a in memory cache or something. So so you know what's neat about V3 is that um, any all of these services become first class citizens. So it's it's no longer the case that you know the app framework is the primary service and everything gets added around it. You can come into OpenShift and just deploy 
that database service or just deploy a messaging service or what have you. Um, and then, so all services are treated equally, and then we basically, um, you know, wire them together to to create the topology um, that you need for your application. The other thing about um, Kubernetes that you know, that's interesting is is uh, it handles not only multi-container deployments but handles them across multiple hosts. And so the scheduler function um, determines that, and then we've built features on top of that, uh, like regions and zones. Uh, to handle to allow the administrators to control placement. Um, so, um, so the scheduler will, de will determine when you deploy, um, uh, you know, these containers wh where they should actually run, and uh, and you know, things like regions will enable you to specify a set of hosts for affinity. So, you know, only run within that select set of hosts, and then zones uh, enable anti-affinity. So, within a region, you can specify zones and uh, and have uh, you know. OpenShift automatically spread uh, your application instances to, uh, to each of those zones equally. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, Kubernetes handles container management. And we talk about this uh, declarative model for container management. What that actually means is that, you know, you actually define uh, how many instances make up your service when you deploy it. And then Kubernetes works to, to maintain that state. So, so if, if the Tomcat service was deployed with four instances, for example, you basically then uh, uh, declare that up front, and then OpenShift will maintain uh, that state. So if any at any point an instance fails and it detects that there are less than four instances running, it'll automatically restart that. So that builds on a functionality we had in V2 called Watchman, but it goes it goes much further. And then we also tie in uh, to that things like our scaler. So if you're going to do uh, manual scaling where you want, or automated scaling where you want to scale up additional instances, essentially you're just updating the declaration. So instead of having uh, four, you might say, you know, now I need five instances. Kubernetes would detect that and then automatically start a fifth instance. And likewise, when you scale down. So so all of this is tied to uh, uh, the uh, the Kubernetes model for for managing you know, how many instances are running. And I put a little diagram here. Uh, this is very high level, not not a technical uh, architecture at all, more of a, a architecture, if you will. But it kind of shows um, some of the concepts that we're referring to. So, so just like in v, v2, there's really two types of instances. Um, there's the nodes where your applications run, and then there's the master, which is uh, you know what we're referring to as uh, what we used to refer to as the broker. Uh, Kubernetes uses that. Um, the terminology master, and you can actually, um, you know, it's showing a single instance there, but you can make that highly available. Um, but the master will run components like uh, all of the APIs um, that developers will use to access the system. So they're all RESTful APIs secured by OAuth, um, and you'll log in through your console CLI or IDE. Um, etcd is our distributed registry, so this you know maintains the state uh, in the system. Uh, you know where you know information on where all of these uh, containers are running and uh, what their IP address is and so forth. Um, and then the replication controller, which um, uh, works with the, the, uh, the kubelet on each of the nodes uh, to manage, um, you know, uh, uh, to do the health management, as I was referring to earlier, to, to uh, you know, maintain uh, dec where you declare and maintain the state for how many instances you want. And then, and then the scheduler, which handles placement. Um, the Kubernetes scheduler is also extensible. Uh, you know, if you look in the open source community, you'll see that um, you know folks have done stuff like you know, worked on integrating the Mesos scheduler with Kubernetes, uh, uh, the Yarn scheduler. So, so if you want to go beyond the scheduling capabilities that Kubernetes provides, there is um, extensibility options there. Um, but like I said, we'll be shipping uh, with uh, uh, the the feature set um, that I think. Uh, you know, handle m many of the tasks that customers need in terms of being able to to do placement uh, according to to their uh, policies. Um, on the right hand side, uh, you know, Kubernetes the deployment uh, is actually uh, something called a pod, the deployment model. So inside those pods, you run one or more containers. Um, so uh, so if you in in Kubernetes uh, terminology, a pod is like an atomic unit um, where you can have a single container or multiple containers running. Um, if you have more than one container, the pod still, you know, uh, all the containers share an IP address. They share storage volume mounts, um, 
and so uh, and they always run on the same machine so uh, so basically um you know example might be a a, a pot a container that does reads and another that does writes but you want to always deploy them uh, together for example um or i have postgres and pg admin uh, as another example um, and then there's really two layers and i should probably change the way this looks but the service layer is basically how um all of these services know about each other right so when you want to uh, connect um connect one service to another you, you basically uh there's a pro a service proxy so that um so that you know one tier can call the other tier at a at a known address but doesn't have to know the ip addresses of each of the pods um and then uh you know a set of labels that identifies where those pods live so the proxy can um, can connect to them um and then the routing layer handles um handles uh routing requests from the outside and so I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit later but this is how your your web requests from your uh, web or mobile clients would route to the actual uh, instances themselves all right so so in terms of the services our plan is to basically um you know ship uh, with the same set of uh, of language runtimes uh, frameworks that we support in v2 except now instead of being packaged as a cartridge these will be packaged as images. And uh, we're gonna just um, start using the standard terminology, um, containers and, and images uh, versus uh, you know, gears and cartridges, which is our, our OpenShift specific terminology, because again, we are adopting you know, uh, you know, the standard. So it's the same containers, the same images, if you were using OpenShift, uh, or if you were running these outside of OpenShift. Um, we are you know, excited about you know, the large and growing community ecosystem of images out there because you know this is essentially the biggest leverage point for for any platform is what can you run on it so this will give customers lots of choices and then on top of that we're we're doing a a certification program uh, so that you, you can get trusted images from red hat or our isv partners so we'll be certifying to things like uh, the content of the container um, and also certifying that the container um, has been uh, tested and certified to work with a known host. Um, our XPaaS uh, uh, program, uh, which is you know how we're bringing more JBoss middleware to the platform, is is also built on this. So so those JBoss services will come in as uh, as Docker containerized uh, images as well. So then all of this gets abstracted, right? And actually um, had an internal meeting today where I, I started. Uh, I just saw the latest. Uh, um, designs on our web console but essentially as an OpenShift user you'll be you know all of the stuff that we just talked about will be largely abstracted you'll you'll come in through uh, either our web front end our web console through our command line interface or through uh, through your ide and we're working uh, with the jboss developer studio a team on an eclipse plugin uh, for OpenShift 3 and, and hopefully you know there'll soon be other uh, plugins as well um, so so that's how uh, uh, users access OpenShift, and, and you know if they don't really care that it's Docker running underneath or Kubernetes, they they shouldn't have to know about that stuff, right? They they're basically focused on deploying their applications and managing them. Um, so so um, so maybe in another session we'll we'll actually uh, go through some of the some of those screens, and if if folks are in the beta, you'll see uh, the latest of that in beta in the beta two drop that just came out today. Um, Actually, today or tomorrow, but it, it's it's coming out this week. We also then um, enable multi-user collaboration, right? So, what does that mean? So, users will work on projects, and projects will be isolated from other projects. Um, so, so when you think about um, some of the container services container that, services that are on you, uh, sorry, it looks like, if everybody could just mute their mute lines, or Diane, if you could just mute mute folks. Um, yeah, I'll mute the uh, Yeah, uh, so um, so if if you look at some of the container services out there, whether it's you know Amazon's container service or Google's, um, what you're really doing is you're spinning up your own set of VMs and then running containers on those VMs, and you actually get charged for the VMs. But OpenShift is a shared environment, right? You you spin up a set of VMs or bare metal instances, and then everybody works on a shared set of instances. So you're your applications uh, you know, could run on the same instances that somebody else's does. Um, and so the project is, uh, uh, it's basically the, uh, almost the equivalent of what we refer to as domains today in OpenShift 2. 
but basically, you know, a user uh, runs applications in their own project, uh, just like they run them in their own domain uh, today, and then multiple users can get access to that project. So if you want to uh, collaborate and share, um, but if you don't have access, you know, you you you'd be uh, restricted, or you you have to create a project for for different users, different teams, um, and then. Uh, all of those uh, access controls will still tie back to your enterprise authentication system. So we'll still have, you know, the SAML-based plugins to LDAP, uh, uh, Kerberos-based systems, and so forth. So you know, we're not going to manage authentication on OpenShift itself. We're going to get the user's identity from you know from wherever you wherever customers store it. Um, so I talked earlier about immutable infrastructure and the implications of that. So so the implications of that is, you know, what your everything that you deploy is based on an image, right? And um, and when you scale up additional instances, uh, you're basically scaling up additional copies of that uh, image, additional instances from that image. Um, the um, you know, and that's great uh, uh, from the perspective of consistency and being able to manage rollbacks, as well as uh, you know, will will speed up the de uh, the deployments. Uh, the challenge is, you know, when you want to change something, you really want to change the image, uh, not change the instance, right? Because if you change just an instance of that um, application, it, you know, if you have to restart it or scale up another one, it, the the new one will start based on the image, not the local change that you made. So what what we what we've integrated is a full um, build automation capability inside of OpenShift. So what this means is when you want to make a change, uh, we're, we'll run a build, automatically create a new image, and then deploy that image. And then if, if there's an issue, we'll automatically roll that back to the prior uh, instance, and so forth. Or, or you can request that it be rolled back, and so forth. So, um, so this build automation is, is, is built in, and we'll support, um, and we'll support that from, a, from a, either a Docker build or, um, or a source code build, right? We have a new capability called source to image. So if you uh, actually, I'll, I'll get into this on the next slide, but um, but basically, there's different build types. We'll also still support um, binary deployments. So if you decide to, uh, you know, to build your instances outside of OpenShift, uh, like you're you're building your images uh, in your own tool chain, uh, then we'll just act as a deployment and management platform for those instances, right? So the customers may already have uh, build or CI infrastructure that's uh, producing. Uh, image binaries, uh, but they want a, a place to run them and manage them and so forth. And so, so at that point, you know, we're not doing any building at all on the platform. We're just um, deploying what you've built. We also introduced this feature of configurable deployment patterns. So, uh, so when you define a deployment, um, you can uh, define the type, and this will allow us to do things like, you know, specify a, a rolling deployment uh, where you, you know, deploy one instance at a time versus, you know. Taking down all the instances at once, uh, and you know, which obviously you wouldn't want to happen if you're in a production uh, environment. So this this slide shows some of the, the the build options, right? So so if you want to do a Docker build, right? Uh, essentially, the input is a Docker file, and then we'll do a standard a Docker build, produce the image, and deploy that, right? And so this would be the equivalent of if you did Docker build on your local machine, except we're doing that at scale, right? Because there may be uh, hundreds or thousands of images being built every week or, or every day, depending on how big your platform is. So this is sort of a, a, a scalable way to do these builds um, at the platform level where, where OpenShift is, is running that for you. Then the source to image build is basically, um, is interesting that, that that allows us to basically just uh, take a source code change and then build it as a layer to an existing image. So it's faster than building the entire image, and it's useful for folks, you know, whether you're a developer who just wants to, you know, Git push some some code to the platform and have us uh, take care of layering it in, or if you're an operator and you want to uh, just push a patch. Um, so uh, so we'll basically uh, take uh, whatever source you provide, take that as input, match that up to the application, uh, the application instances, identify those images, um, you know, build and build that. Uh, in at, at a layer and then redeploy that uh, or you know deploy the new instance and so forth um, and then underneath we're working on a feature called app gen that will actually allow us to um, 
to inspect any arbitrary image and generate the, the metadata that would be required to uh, to deploy it in OpenShift uh, and, and turn it into a builder image like you see below. Um, so, so you know you can you can run arbitrary images or arbitrary Docker files if you're using the Docker build approach. Uh, if you want to actually uh, turn it into a source to image uh, builder, um, you know we can. Uh, you know, we're working to to make that automatic as well. So you just provide us with the image, and we'll um, we'll generate uh, the appropriate um, the appropriate uh, de uh, deployable image for you. So um, the other next area is uh, container networking. So uh, networking changes quite a bit in V3 relative to V2 uh, in a couple of ways. First, um, in V2. Um, the containers that you deployed, the gears, they weren't directly uh, routable, right? They did not have IP addresses. You had a single IP address on each node, and then uh, essentially uh, an Apache router that would route uh, to uh, the gears, uh, which were all running on local loopbacks, right? At 127 uh, XXX addresses. Um, and um, and you know the nice part about uh, uh, containers through Kubernetes is uh, each container does have a, a directly routable IP address. So the container starts to, uh, you know, look more like a VM from that perspective um, and, uh, you know, makes you know, this a whole lot of uh, challenges go, go away in terms of, you know, how you're able to, to deploy stuff within those containers. Um, the challenge is, you know, that's a lot of IP addresses to manage. So uh, we're moving to a, a software-based uh, networking implementation. And the current one that we're um, that we're uh, planning on is is uh, based on Open vSwitch. We're going through some some performance benchmarking on that now, but this will be in the box, right? So this is not something that you would have to sort of uh, manage. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll deploy uh, a networking configuration that will run where wherever RHEL runs, uh, and you know, and you know, wherever OpenShift runs as well. So uh, so we want to make sure that um, so that what's available in the box um, you know just works in addition to that you know we're working uh, upstream in kubernetes to plug that into a to a networking api such that if you have other sdn solutions you could leverage those as well and so so in that respect for customers that have already made an investment in sdn and maybe they're maybe they're doing that uh, through openstack neutron uh, maybe they're doing that through through partners like nuage or cisco or others um, they could leverage that with OpenShift as an alternative to what we're providing out of the box. The other thing that changes in OpenShift, as I mentioned, is um, is routing, right? So, so again, we don't have the Apache-based routers um, on each node, uh, and then we don't uh, we're no longer uh, putting sort of separate HA proxy routers in front of each scaled application. We've actually taken the router tier out and made it a a, a platform-wide routing tier. That can route to any instances on any of the hosts, um, and you know by default that gets deployed as a redundant router. So there's uh, there's uh, two instances, um, you know, for availability, and um, and so the routes get updated, uh, uh, you know, by uh, you know by the routing tier being connected through etcd. So it's aware when new instances are deployed, um, so it'll automatically update. Uh, the routing table um, and then you know traffic that's coming into your applications uh, again from web or mobile devices will automatically uh, uh, be uh, routed to the appropriate instances uh, by our routing tier the other thing that this facilitates is is then replacing that routing tier with your own uh, routing infrastructure so a common request for our on-premise customers is you know i or you know is customers who say they've already made a big investment in say hardware based we're based load balancing or or you know highly scalable routing and so forth and they want to use that uh, instead of using what we provide which is a software based uh, mechanism and so so this facilitates that type of um, of swap out as well and so we want to make uh, this component and in fact many of our components easily uh, uh, swappable or you know able to integrate with with what customers may want to use as an alternative um, there was a, a commons briefing a couple of weeks back um, where we showed uh, uh, a demonstration of the of the routing of the vSwitch based uh, uh, networking uh, capability, and so uh, I encourage folks to watch that. Um, 
last it's, week or a couple weeks so ago, Joe, we did a session on storage. Joe, before you move on, there's a there's a question um, that that um, where Jason Ford has asked from um, Black Mesh um, with regards Let's to OBS. Me. Yeah, let me um, get through. The, I got a couple more slides, and I'll come back and take all the questions at the end. All right, but, perfect. Yeah, that, that might be easier for me. Um, so, um, so, uh, so, the storage. Uh, we talked about this um, last uh, last session, right? And again, a, a great briefing if for folks who haven't watched it. We're basically, um, you know, we have a goal in OpenShift uh, to ultimately allow folks to run whatever they want. Uh, on the platform, right? So not just um, stateless um, services, but stateful services as well, right? So as is the case today, you you don't have to run everything on the platform. So if you want to run application instances on OpenShift that connect to services running outside of OpenShift, either in VMs or on you know uh, elsewhere in your infrastructure or or coming from a cloud service, you can certainly do that. Um, but if you do want to start running more uh, stateful services on the platform, things like databases, messaging queues, we want to make that um, easier to manage. And so that's where uh, we're making use of uh, shared storage through Kubernetes and the ability to map um, that storage to the pods that are running your containers. Um, so you'll see um, you know, a more detailed view of that in the, uh, in the briefing I mentioned. Uh, but then this, the idea is to make this extensible so that we'd have uh, plugins for things like NFS, iSCSI, different cloud storage options. And then essentially, um, you'd have you know two you two um, user personas, you know the the person who's actually setting up uh, the storage pools, and then uh, an end user, a developer who's basically uh, making a, a request for a volume to be mapped to his application. So that user is you know requesting storage and and requesting that to be provisioned uh, in the same way that they just request that that we provision their applications and essentially mapping uh, one to the other. Um, internally in, in OpenShift, um, there'll be a registry component. So, um, so we actually have integrated uh, a, a, a Docker. There'll be a Docker v2 based registry, um, and that's where we're actually storing all the images that we run and and images that we're um, updating and managing for users as they uh, as they uh, uh, you know deploy updates to their applications. So this is all you know part of the platform. You'll notice it's one of the components, and actually one of the cool things when you install OpenShift it, it's a very lightweight um, binary like 40 or 50 megs that, that's the entire thing and some additional components that we actually install as docker images so we're uh, three is one of the router is another um, so so the installation consists of the main binary and then um, and then a handful of, of, of containers or container images that uh, that get then pulled down and deployed um and so you know we do that reasons you know partly dog fooding but also um but also we think that, you know it's a great way to run <laughs> these components and we want to make sure that if we're telling you to run your applications this way that we should be able to run our own applications um this way um so so there'll be authentication the authentication and access controls um will be applied to those images so you can control you know which uh, what users have access to. In addition to that, you can you can integrate with with external registries. So, for example, at Red Hat, our satellite team, which is uh, our Red Hat satellite product team, is adding uh, enterprise container registry capabilities to to that product line. So, if you're using satellite as your content manager for RPMs, you'll you know soon be able to use that as uh, as a content manager for image-based content as well. And then you can actually pull that, pull those images into OpenShift, and we'll have workflows that describe that. Um, and obviously, you can also pull in stuff from Docker Hub or other third-party enterprise registries. So wherever you ultimately want to manage your content, uh, you can continue to do that. And then, you know, when you run it in OpenShift, we'll just pull it in and deploy it, and then pull in uh, updates to that as, um, you know, as as new content becomes available. And then. Um, Lastly, uh, you know, on the administration side, we really want to, to um, you know, improve things here as well, right? So first thing we want to do is make it as simple to install OpenShift as it is to install applications uh, that run on top of OpenShift. And, you know, for folks who have been with us since the 1.0 days, you know, it wasn't always that simple to get an OpenShift environment stood up. 
um, I think for folks who are going through the beta, you'll see you know, a vast improvement in that area, right? It's a very lightweight uh, binary, installs very quickly, um, and should be a lot easier to get up and running. We're doing some interesting work with um, integrating, uh, actually underneath the covers for our default installer, we've in integrated um, Ansible as a deployment mechanism. So that's actually what's handling the deployment for the default installer. It's, it's part of the package. Um, but then we'll also be working on a, a puppet, uh, um, uh, Puppet modules and um, and alternative deployment mechanisms. So whatever you want to use to deploy, you'll be able to. We don't we don't impose anything on that. Um, as I mentioned, the the separate routing tier should simplify greatly. Um, integration into DNS and external routing infrastructure. Um, you'll still be able to, as an administrator, uh, integrate with your enterprise auth systems. Um, and then. Um, in terms of the administration console, and then we'll have a full set of admin APIs, I think are a much richer set than what you saw in V2. Um, so, so you can manage at the API level. And then, you know, we had it sort of a very basic admin console uh, in V2. We're now working uh, internally with uh, another product team at Red Hat, which is our Manage IQ and CloudForms team. And they're actually building out, uh, you know, a, a richer, uh, management framework for both containers and OpenShift itself, uh, which will be embedded uh, as part of the solution and so forth. So, so there's some new things coming uh, in terms of uh, administration tools that we'll be able to provide as part of the package as well. So, so hopefully that'll um, help on the operations and administration side. Um, so a couple more slides here. So uh, from the release schedule perspective, uh, uh, I would encourage folks um, you know, if you're thinking about trying it out, uh, beta two actually uh, came out this week. Um, in fact, I believe today. Um, so, um, so uh, you can try that out. W what we're doing is we decided to try to do a drop each month between now and, we're tr and when we go GA. So we did a, a beta one in February. You know, and it was it, the early betas have really um, more of the low level functionality, so you don't have all of the all of the nice GUIs or the fully blown command line uh, interface and so forth. But um, but for folks who are, who are already working with uh, beta one, you can see a lot of the stuff in action. Uh, beta two comes out today. There'll be another beta drop in April, and there's likely to be one in May as well, although we're still trying to uh, confirm that. But with each beta drop, you get closer to sort of the finished project. We're targeting sort of a mid-year release. Um, the end of June is is the current projection for being a fully uh, GA. So um, then we'll, we'll GA first with OpenShift Enterprise, um, and then we'll also have a, a, a preview environment um, uh, online, a hosted environment online that we're gonna be um, expanding upon and then ultimately converting the current OpenShift online environment over. So there'll, there'll be more on that um, uh, post June. Um, so hopefully you've seen you know, how we're bringing it all together. Uh, again, you know, this is more than just you know a, a bag of components, right? This is more than just Docker or Kubernetes. This is really what we're really trying to do is build a fully uh, integrated uh, platform, um, so you know developers uh, and administrators can just do their jobs, right? So uh, really take advantage of all of these uh, cool new technologies that are coming into the space, but um, but not have to burden you with knowing about um, you know the the inner inner workings of of the various uh, bits and pieces, and also making sure that we can run this all at scale, right? So that it's not just um, you know one developer you know running containers on just his one machine, but it's really you know hundreds of developers running you know thousands of containers across you know hundreds or of of host instances and so forth. So we really want to build a scalable platform that will grow. Uh, and you know, leverage the best of what's out there from from Docker to Kubernetes to all of the, the low level pieces. So, um, so with that, I'll, uh, if you want to learn more, you can come to our uh, community site, OpenShift.org. So, you know, you can, in addition to participating in the enterprise betas, anybody can grab the latest sources um, from OpenShift Origin. Um, you know, we update that uh, pretty regularly. Uh, that you know, that's you know. The trunk, but if you want a more controlled experience, then um, then I would suggest uh, taking one of the the official beta drops where we have actually uh, documented workflows and um, and it's been tested out uh, against those flows. So I'll switch to the console now uh, and look at questions. So 
Thanks. For All right. Thank you very much, Joe. It was one question um, outstanding there early on from Jason Ford. Okay. Get back there. Yeah, I, I guess I can just say it instead of you having yeah. to read it. But easy. So what we kind of see in doing double uh, virtualization. So if we're running a, a open vSwitch underneath on the on a bare metal you know, hypervisor, and then we spin KVM instances on top of that, and then run OVS inside of that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you pay that that double virtualization penalty. Yeah. Uh, how are you overcoming that? I guess in are are you overcoming that? Is the first question, and the second question is yeah. How, how's that working out? Okay. Yeah. So so what we're doing so so there's a lot of um you know you know work going on in the container networking area, right? So in addition to stuff that we're doing here, there's um, solutions like Flannel and Weave and, uh, and others out there. We've been sort of benchmarking all of them, right? So so you're right, like the, the performance results that you'd get with OVS on bare metal will exceed what you get with, you know, with running that on top of VMs or on top of containers. We've, we've certainly seen that. Uh, what we're trying to do is, um, um, you know, get to a model where we can we can uh, achieve greater scale than some of the alternative solutions out there, right? We have um, customers that want to run, as I mentioned, hundreds of instances and uh, you know, uh, tens of thousands of containers, right? So I think I think our initial target is uh, our, we're testing it up to I, I believe it's 200 instances and I want to say 50 containers uh, per instance. So so where, where that math comes is 10,000 or 100,000 containers. Um, uh, so that that's the scale we're testing to. You know, I, I think that um, you know I'm not a networking guy, so I can't really comment on on um, on the specifics of the implementation. Um, there was a prior uh, uh, session that I'll, I'll point you to to check that out, and then we can you know maybe hook you up with some of our folks working on that to to get your to get their perspective. But the the goal here too is to make it pluggable, right? So if you have a more scalable implementation. We're going to plug our default in through Kubernetes, and then sort of we've been doing work upstream um, there to enable you know other alternatives to be plugged in just the same and so forth. So so um, so we want to provide something that scales well out of the box, but also allow for that flexibility. Um, I, I believe in our tests right now, the OVS implementation has been scaling uh, you know better than than some of the alternatives out there. Um, like uh, you know, like Weave or, or others, for example. But but I think there's still more work to be done in terms of uh, t benchmarking and and tuning to 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 before we get to June. So so stay tuned for more on that. Um, let's see other questions. Chris has been doing a good job answering. Um, I don't know, Chris. Is is there any questions that you want to highlight here? Uh, 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 unless someone wasn't happy with my answers. <laughs> okay. Uh, right. Yeah. So for folks, who, folks who aren't looking through the chat, there's there's quite a rich uh, set of Q and A there. Um, just trying to find anything that hasn't been answered. Uh, Another quick question. Um, yeah. In the previous version of Open, um, there was a lot of support for. Well, there was at least some support for Windows apps, actually, and yeah. running OpenShift on Windows. Um, yeah. Any plans around that? Yeah, I, I can talk to that uh, a little bit. So, so, um, so upstream, you know, I think what you're referring to is um, we had work done in Origin by one of our partners um, to, to basically take um, Windows instances and connect them through our broker tier, so that you could actually deploy um, .NET apps or, or other Windows services the same way you services on our Linux nodes, and that was really cool. We did uh, officially productize that. Um, there were some challenges uh, in to a full ported state, um, so not necessarily technical challenges. Um, but um, but in terms of where we're going with that, it, it's actually interesting. You know, there's essentially two paths now. Uh, one one of the things that we were excited to see is uh, Microsoft um, announcing that they too were supporting uh, Docker. Um, and that they're going to uh, essentially um, uh, bring containerization to Windows, um, uh, and you know, and sort of mate that to the Docker uh, API, right? And so, 
so this this sort of um, and, and we've actually, by the way, I've spoken to them about that, uh, uh, you know, as well. You know, as just part of uh, working with other folks in the community, we think that's pretty exciting um, because since we've adopted that API, you know, that'll sort of op open the door for us to essentially uh, you know, run Windows containers. Uh, and and I think that they've actually delayed the next release of Windows Server. Um, hopefully, with uh, with the goal of getting this out. So, so that's certainly something that we're we're watching is containers on Windows um, through the through the same Docker API that we're using because that would uh, bring it in uh, from that respect. Um, the other thing also is you know they've open sourced the .NET runtime, uh, so .NET on Linux is now a possibility in the not uh, so distant future. So that will allow you to run the .NET services just on the on the rel nodes and so forth. So. So yeah, I think it's still early days, but um, the, the benefit is both of these now are being driven by Microsoft themselves. So you have the the, uh, the chance for something that's going to be more supportable uh, long term uh, because it's coming from the source. And and we're heavily involved with that, so um, yeah, we'll we'll see where things turn up. Yeah, during the course of the year. Yeah, run exchange. I don't know if you can run exchange on it. <laughs> um, uh, other uh, other questions. Uh, feel free to either unmute your mic or put anything into the chat. If not, we're we're actually almost at the end of the hour here, and um, okay. I really want to thank uh, Joe again and Chris for answering questions on the chat. It's great to have you here. And we'll be doing this again hopefully next week and we'll do a lot more of it. If there are other topics that you guys would like to hear about, please um, let me know and I'll, I'll try and arrange guest speakers. Um, and if you have a topic that's near and dear to your heart that you'd like to talk about, uh, let me know as well and we'll give you a forum to pontificate about it to your part other fellow participants. So again, thanks Joe um, and thanks Chris for, for doing this again today. Uh, All right, thanks everybody.